Barakote 21b, or a case where he prayed as part of a congregation and began to repeat it as part of a congregation. However, in a case where he initially prayed by himself and subsequently joined the congregation at the venue where it was praying, we might have said that an individual via V the congregation is considered as one who has not prayed. Therefore, he taught us that in this case, too, one may not repeat the prayer. And, on the other hand, if he had taught us here only with regard to one who entered a synagogue, we would have thought that the reason he may not pray again is because he did not yet begin to recite the prayer. But there, in the case where he already began to recite the prayer, say that this is not the case that he may continue to repeat the prayer. Therefore, both statements are necessary. Rav Huna said, One who did not yet pray and enters a synagogue and found that the congregation is in the midst of reciting the Amida prayer, if he is able to begin and complete his own prayer before the prayer leader reaches the blessing of thanksgiving, Modim, he should begin to pray, and if not, he should not begin to pray. Rabbi Yahashua ben Levi said, if he is able to begin and complete his prayer before the prayer leader reaches sanctification, Kedusha, then he should begin to pray. If not, then he should not begin to pray. The Gemara clarifies, with regard to what did they disagree? The basis for their dispute is that one sage, Rav Huna, holds an individual is permitted to recite Kedusha on his own. So he need not insist on reciting it along with the prayer leader. And the other sage, Rabbi Yahashua ben Levi, holds that an individual may not recite Kedusha alone. And, therefore, he is required to complete his prayer before the communal prayer leader reaches Kedusha. Similarly, Rav Ara Bar Ahava stated, in accordance with the second opinion, from where is it derived that an individual may not recite Kedusha alone? As it is stated, And I shall be hallowed among the children of Israel. Leviticus 22, verse 32. And any expression of sanctity may not be recited in a quorum of fewer than ten men. The Gemara asks, How is this inferred from the verse? The Gemara responds, This must be understood in light of a bereta, which was taught by Rabbanai, the brother of Rabbi Haya bar Abba. It is inferred by means of a verbal analogy, Gezera Shava, between the words among, among. Here it is written, And I shall be hallowed among the children of Israel. And there regarding Korah's congregation, it is written, Separate yourselves from among this congregation. Numbers 16.21 Just as there among Kanotes 10, so too here among Kanotes 10. The connotation of ten associated with the word among written in the portion of Korah is, in turn derived by means of another verbal analogy between the word congregation written there 
and the word congregation written in reference to the ten spies who slandered Eretz Yisrael. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? Numbers 14.27 Consequently, among the congregation, there must be at least ten. And, in any case, everyone agrees that one may not interrupt his prayer in order to respond to Kedusha. However, a dilemma was raised before the sages of the yeshiva. What is the ruling? Is one permitted to interrupt his prayer in order to recite, May his great name be blessed, in Kaddish? When Rav Dimi came from Eretz Yisrael to Babylonia, he said, Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon, disciples of Rabbi Yohanan, said, One may not interrupt his prayer for anything, except for, May his great name be blessed, as even if one was engaged in the exalted study of the act of the divine chariot, Ma'ase Merkava. See Ezekiel 1. He stops to recite it. However, the Gemara concludes, the Halakha is not in accordance with his opinion. We learned in the Mishnah that Rabbi Yehuda says with regard to one who experiences a seminal emission, he recites a blessing beforehand and afterward in both the case of Shema and in the case of food. The Gemara asks, Is that to say that Rabbi Yehuda holds that one who experienced a seminal omission is permitted to engage in matters of Torah? Didn't Rabbi Yahashua ben Levi say, From where in the Torah is it derived that one who experiences a seminal omission is prohibited from engaging in matters of Torah. As it is stated, Just take heed and guard your soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart for all the days of your life, and you shall impart them to your children and your children's children. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, from which we derive, among other things, the obligation to study Torah. And, juxtaposed to it, is the verse, the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. This juxt juxtaposition teaches us that just as below, at the revelation at Mount Sinai, those who experienced a seminal emission were prohibited and were commanded to refrain from relations with their wives and immerse themselves. So too here, throughout the generations, those who experience a seminal emission are prohibited from engaging in Torah study. And if you say that Rabbi Yehuda does not derive homiletic interpretations from juxtaposed verses, didn't Rav Yosef already say, even one who does not derive homiletic interpretations from juxtaposed verses throughout the entire Torah, nevertheless derives them in Deuteronomy? Mishnah Torah, as Rabbi Yehuda does not derive homiletic interpretations, from juxtaposed verses throughout the entire Torah, and he does derive them in Mishnah Torah. And from where do we derive that Rabbi Yehuda does not derive homiletic interpretations from juxtaposed verses throughout the entire Torah? as it was taught in a bereta with regard to the punishment of a sorceress. Ben Azai says, It is stated, 
you shall not allow a sorceress to live. Exodus twenty two seventeen. Although the manner of her execution is not specified, and it is stated, whoever lies with a beast shall surely be put to death. Exodus twenty two eighteen, the fact that the Torah juxtaposed this matter to that was to say, just as one who lies with a beast is executed by stoning, see Leviticus 20, so too a sorceress is executed by stoning. With regard to this proof, Rabbi Yehuda said to him, and does the fact that the Torah juxtaposed this matter to that warrant taking this person out to be stoned? Should he be sentenced to the most severe death of the death penalties on that basis? Rather, the sources, mediums and wizards, were included among all sorcerers. And why were they singled out from the rest? In the verse, and a man or a woman who is a medium or a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood is upon them. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 27. In order to draw an analogy to them and say to you, just as a medium and a wizard are executed by stoning, so too is a sorceress executed by stoning. And from where do we derive that Rabbi Yehuda derives homiletic interpretations from juxtaposed verses in Mishnah Torah? As it was taught in another Bereta, Rabbi Eliezer said that a man may wed a woman raped by his father and one seduced by his father. A woman raped by his son and one seduced by by his son. Though one is prohibited by Torah law from marrying the wife of his father or the wife of his son, this prohibition does not apply to a woman raped or seduced by them. And Rabbi Yehuda prohibits him from marrying a woman raped by his father and a woman seduced by his father. And Rav Gidel said that Rav said, What is the reason for Rabbi Yehuda's opinion? As it is written, A man shall not take his father's wife, and shall not uncover his father's skirt. Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. The last expression, And shall not uncover his father's skirt, implies that, a skirt that has been seen by his father, i.e. any woman who has had sexual relations with his father, her father, may not be uncovered by his son, i.e. his son may not marry her. And from where do we know that the verse is written with regard to a woman raped by his father, and the previous section juxtaposed to it, deals with the laws of rape, and the man who lay with her must give her father fifty shekels, because he has violated her. Deuteronomy 22 verse 29. At any rate, we see that in Deuteronomy, Rabbi Yehuda derives homiletic interpretations from juxtaposed verses. Why does he fail to derive that one who experiences a seminal omission is prohibited from engaging in matters of Torah from the juxtaposition of, juxtaposition of the verses? They replied, indeed, in Mishnah Torah, Rabbi Yehuda does derive homiletic interpretations from the juxtaposition of verses, but he requires the, these juxtaposed verses in order to derive another statement 
of Rabbi Yahashua ben Levi. As Rabbi Yahashua ben Levi said, one who teaches his son Torah. The verse ascribes to him credit as if he received the Torah from Mount Horeb. As it is stated, and you shall impart them to your children and your children's children. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9. After which it is written, the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. Therefore, Rabbi Yehuda cannot derive from that same juxtaposition a prohibition banning one who experienced a seminal omission from engaging in matters of Torah. We learned in a Mishnah that a Zav who experienced a seminal omission and a menstruating woman who discharged semen and a woman who engaged in intercourse with her husband, and she saw menstrual blood, all of whom are ritually impure for at least seven days due to the severity of their impurity, nevertheless require ritual immersion in order to purify themselves from the impurity of the seminal emission before they may engage in matters of Torah. And Rabbi Yehuda exempts them from immersion. However, Rabbi Yehuda only exempted from immersion in the case of a Zav, who experienced a seminal omission, who was unfit to immerse himself from the outset, as even after immersion, he would remain impure with the seven-day impurity of the Zav. But in the case of one who experienced a seminal omission alone, with no concurrent impurity, even Rabbi Yehuda requires immersion before he may engage in Torah matters. And if you say, the same is true even in the case of one who experienced a seminal omission alone, that Rabbi Yehuda also exempts him from immersion. And the fact that they disagree in the case of a Zav who experienced a seminal omission and not in the case of a person who experienced a seminal emission alone, is in order to convey the far-reaching nature of the opinion of the rabbis, who require immersion even in this case. If so, say the last case of that same Mishnah, a woman who was engaged in intercourse and she saw menstrual blood requires immersion. The Gemara seeks to clarify, in accordance with whose opinion was this case in the Mishnah taught. If you say that it is in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis, that is obvious. If in the case of Azav, who experienced a seminal omission, who was unfit to immerse himself from the outset, when he experienced the seminal omission, the rabbis nevertheless require immersion. All the more so wouldn't they require immersion for a woman who engaged in intercourse and only then saw blood. Who was fit to immerse herself from the outset when she came into contact with the seminal omission of her husband? Rather, isn't this Rabbi Yehuda's opinion? And this case was taught specifically in order to teach that a woman who engaged in intercourse and saw menstrual blood is not required to immerse herself. 